and welcome to another episode of Cup of Science, the online show that says we don't care what vessel you're drinking from, everything is a cup to us and we can't wait to fill it with science. Oh, I am your host Phil Bell Young and in today's show we're not just dipping our toes in the water, we're going full on deep sea diving with Dr. Kath Waller and her talk on the isolation of Antarctica. We recommend that you wear something warm for this one. Plus, special guest Sarah Cosgriff will be turning up the pressure with her spectacular showcase of science demonstrations. More about that later. And we'll be finishing our show today like we finish every time with a questions round from you, our wonderful audience. More on that later. First of all, you're probably all wondering, Phil, what's with the hat? So this episode of Cup of Science has been inspired by our oceans. For those of you who might have missed it, yesterday was World Oceans Day, the time of year where we not only talk about our oceans, but raise awareness about the issues facing them. Which is why tonight, in addition to knowing where you're watching us from, what biscuits you've got, we also want to know, do you have any weird and wonderful ocean-based facts or jokes that you want to share with us because we want to hear them. Anything. It could be a joke you heard many, many years ago. It could be your favorite fact that you pull out in those situations where you want to know, want people to know that you know a lot about the ocean, or it could be a recommendation. Where did you last go where you saw the ocean? Uh, for me, it was the beautiful Yorkshire coast. Uh, I can't even remember how long ago because this lockdown has got me a little bit confused. But tell me what uh, facts you have about the ocean. You can do that by commenting beneath this live feed in the comments section, or you can tweet us using the hashtag Cup of Science, as well as the at Pint of Science or at Philby91, which is me. Right, without further delay, it is time to grab your cups. Don't forget the biscuits. And let's get started. Our speaker tonight is an environmental marine scientist who has spent the last 17 years researching in the Antarctic ecosystems. Her research focuses on plastic pollution and invasive species, but her interests include the impacts of environmental change and what this means for the ecosystem and the life that live there. She has worked all over the Antarctic Peninsula from the Adelaide Islands to South Georgia. But tonight, she joins us from her living room. Ladies and gentlemen, raise your cups for Dr. Kath Waller. Hello. Hello there. Um, right, OK. So, yeah, I work in Antarctica. Um, so this is me uh, in various different places. I work right down here on uh, Rothera Research Station down at Adelaide Island through the South Shetlands, the South Orkneys, up into beautiful South Georgia, and then the Falkland Islands as well. So um, I've worked uh, in bases, I've camped on islands, I've worked from HMS Endurance, which is the image you can see with me in front of the helicopter, which was amazing, um, because we've got to get fly around everywhere. And the image I started with was something I took from the helicopter. So it's a really exciting, really great place to work. Um, and what I started thinking about is how isolated is Antarctica. Antarctica is at the bottom of the world. It's a continent on its own, surrounded by ocean. There's very little land south of about 55 degrees. So um, it's, it's totally isolated by this strong current called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. Um, it's very different from anywhere else in the world because there's no population, nobody lives there permanently. It is designated as a natural reserve for science and peaceful study, uh, and it's governed by the Antarctic Treaty. So, so it's a very, very different place to work. Um, now, as I said, uh, Antarctica, there's no, no land. If you look at the image here, you can see that there's no land south of the tip of um, South America. So what happens because the Earth turns in a particular way, you get very, very strong winds forming and circling around the Antarctic continent and the Southern Ocean. And they create this really strong current and it's called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. Um, it's unique anywhere in the world in that the current goes around in the same direction on the surface as it does in the deep ocean. 
So in normal ocean circulation, you get a warm water current flowing one way, and then a cold water as the water cools, as it gets towards the pole, it sinks, and you get a cold water current going in the opposite direction underneath it in the deep ocean. But this current is really, really special because it goes around and around Antarctica in the same direction, a clockwise direction from the surface right down to the deep sea bed. And that means that historically, this has been seen as a really, really strong isolating barrier for Antarctica. If you can't swim against it, if you're not a whale or you can't hitch a lift on a ship, then everybody thinks that you won't be able to get across the Antarctic circumpolar current. So things like larvae uh, and things like that, it's, it's always been thought that they're, they're going to be stuck outside and conversely, the Antarctic stuff contained inside. So that's the paradigm that, that we've been working on for a long time. Um, just to give you an idea, Antarctica and the, uh, the Southern Ocean, are the, it's, it's the stormiest seas in the world. So I'm just showing you a little video clip. It's taken from the James Clark Ross, which is the, uh, the old research ship being replaced by the uh, Sir David Attenborough now. This is going across the Drake. That water that you just see hitting the window, we're on the bridge, which is about 10 meters high. And we're in about force 11 here. So it's really, really strong current, really, really um, heavy seas and, uh, and really, really rough quite a lot of the time. So again, difficult to sort of um, to, to think about things being able to move across that sort of environment. If you're looking at what's happening to, to the environment as well. So the, the, the plot here with the orange on the circle here, shows Antarctica and it shows us sea surface temperature. So this is the temperature of the top, say 10 centimeters of the of the, the ocean. So what you're seeing here is this blue area around Antarctica is around about minus two, sea water freezes at minus 1.8. So it's about minus 1.8 to about plus 1.8, generally speaking. And as you move away from Antarctica and up the coast of South America and up towards the tropics, this water temperature increases and warms. Now, if you look at the other image, this is what's happening on the seafloor. So what you can see here is the temperature around Antarctica is still about minus two to plus two, but it's the same all the way up the seafloor, apart from these sort of coastal areas that you can see on them, on the coast of South America in, in, the, in the shallows and the continental shelf where it's a bit warmer. So again, if you're looking at the animals that are living in Antarctica and having to deal with things in Antarctica, if you wanted to get across as a, a new species into Antarctica, if you live on the seafloor, there's nothing to stop you from crawling, if you can, along the seafloor into the Antarctic. You're certainly not going to be stopped by it being too cold for you because you're used to that temperature. But if you're something that lives in the surface and is used to temperatures of you know 10 or 11, then at the moment, it doesn't look like you're going to be able to get, even if you get there, it's going to be too cold for you to survive. So these are some of the, um, the, the sort of issues that um, these, these animals and these interactions of uh, different communities of animals have to deal with. So I just thought I would also say that although we think Antarctica is isolated from the rest of the world, and it is to a, a greater or large, uh, smaller degree, when you look at what's happening in terms of what's happening to the ice shelves and glaciers and things like that, Antarctica can have quite a profound effect on what's happening in the rest of the world. So if you look at uh, the arrow here, all these little circles show different glaciers and how quickly they're melting. So the bigger the circle, the more ice is being lost. The smaller the circle, less ice. And if it's black, it's melting, it's surface melt. And if it's hatched, it's icebergs carving off. So you can see not only how much they're melting, but what they're doing in a bit more detail. So this one here, the Thwaites Glacier, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's sort of down under Amundsen Sea, this, this glacier here. Um, this is really, really remote, but it's melting quite quickly. And we know that if the whole of the Thwaites Glacier melts, it will probably increase global sea levels by about half a metre. So although Antarctica is quite isolated, it can have a real significant effect on what's happening in the rest of the world. Um, so anyway, back to the animals. Um, what do we know about what's there already? So what you can see on this image is these are loads and loads of pictures that we've taken on various research cruises 
um, of all sorts of different marine invertebrates. They're all found uh, living on the bottom in, in Antarctic waters. So if you look at what's living, what's a marine animal in Antarctica, there's about nine, nine and a half, ten thousand species um, being described. That's by no way the number that's there. That's the, just the number that we know and we have described. Um, there are only about 90 species that live in these surface waters that are, you know, things like penguins, whales, um, things like that. There are around 700 species that live in this pelagic environment. So this midwater environment, that's things like krill, copepods um, and, and, and plankton-y type things, fish, pelagic fish. But by far and away, the most are these benthic species that live on the seafloor and the continental shelf and slope of Antarctica. Um, so what's going to happen to them? Um, well, we know that in places in Antarctica, we're getting really big increases in, in air and sea temperature. So this is the Antarctic Peninsula on this blue plot here. This is a bit the finger of land that sticks up towards South America. It's where I do most of my work. And what you can see in the plot above it is, so this is temperature trends and predictions per 100 years, per degree, how many degrees per 100 years of warming. So you can see this spot here that I'm circling. This is the Antarctic Peninsula. And it, it's predicted about two, two and a half to three degrees warming in that 100 year period. Um, and again, this is real data taken from um, this base here, Fedansky, up at the top of the peninsula. And this is air temperature. So you see from... 1950 to 2002, it's had a three degree increase from about, this is the average over the year, from about minus five and a half to minus three. So we're seeing these shifts in temperature. And all of these are going to have consequences for what's there already and what might be able to get in and survive. So what can you do if you're a marine animal and you're living in an environment and it's warming, what can you do? Well, you can move from the area that's hot to deeper water so you could move down the continental slope into deeper cooler water which is not really an option in antarctica because as i showed you earlier the sea surface and the sea floor temperatures are very very similar um, the other option is you can move polewards so if you're a, a creature that's uh, somewhere on the uh, sort of uh, coast of america and it's getting warmer you can shift closer up to alaska Again, not really possible for Antarctic species. You can adapt. Um, so a lot of work that some of my colleagues are doing is looking at how, whether or not they're physiologically able to adapt to these changing temperatures, whether they can deal with them and how quickly they can adapt. And if you can't do that, you're going to die. So there's a lot of work being done on how these marine ecosystems and communities in Antarctica are going to be able to cope with a changing environment. Uh, and because these communities are likely to get stressed, it, it introduces the question of what's going to happen, you know, when other species can, can get in there and can try and establish. And at the moment, we just don't know what, what the consequences are going to be. It's something that we're trying to work on and trying to, trying to understand. So just to give you an idea, uh, it's a little bit out of date now, but these are data from uh, sort of fairly current temperatures. So what you can see is that around Antarctica, you've mostly got dark blue or light blue. So you've mostly got temperatures around minus two to minus one to zero. If you look what's happening using the International uh, Panel on Climate Change um, models and predict what might happen in uh, another 70 years time, um, you can see that this area around the, the, the west of the Antarctic Peninsula has warmed up into one to two degrees, um, has, as, has as this area around um, the uh, South Orkneys and South Georgia. And this, this area around um, the west of the peninsula, it, there's much more of the paler blue, so it's, it, it's, it's warmed a little bit. So um, it looks like in the future we are going to have a, a warmer um, environment that things are going to have to either deal with, adapt, or potentially go extinct. So then the question is, can things get there? Can, bearing in mind that the Antarctic current is quite, um, quite strong, can things actually get across it? So 
I've been convinced for a while that they can. Um, so this is some work that was being done by a colleague of mine. I'm just going to set this going. So this is a model, and these particles here have been released from South Georgia, and they're, they're sort of wandering around. So this is a model showing how they move around in the currents. So the blue and the, the purple and the yellow are all the currents and how strong they are. And this was done because my colleague had found a piece of kelp on the Antarctic Peninsula, and when she'd looked at the genetics, it had come from South Georgia. So we tried to model, she tried to model, what happens if you release things from South Georgia? Can they get to the peninsula? How do they get there? And these orangey dots are the particles that are going to hit the Antarctic and the blue ones are going to get spit out. And remember that this current is supposed to be really strong and nothing can get across unless it can swim across. So what you're seeing now is it's taking about two years. It's coming around to its second year here and the peninsula is coming up and these particles are going to make landfall on the peninsula. We've got one little guy down there that's snuck in on that side. But there you go. They've, they've hit Antarctica. So we would got a piece of circumstantial evidence. We've got a piece of kelp that we knew was here, but it had come from round there. It couldn't go back against the current. So we've got that first piece of piece of evidence to say these things are probably not as um, as impermeable as, as maybe we thought in the past. Uh, we also, myself and colleagues from uh, various universities in Chile, Brazil uh, and British Antarctic Survey, various places, um, found uh, a piece of kelp in Deception Island. So Deception Island is this island here. Again, it's up on the peninsula. Deception is a volcanic island. So it's warmer than the normal waters around Antarctica because it is volcanic. Um, but um, we found a piece of kelp and the kelp, these green dots show where all the kelp, this species of kelp here, this macrocystis, where it's been found in the past. It's not been found on the peninsula at all. So we've got a piece of non-native kelp alive in deception. We also found this little creature here, which is a bryozoan. So they're sort of little encrusting things that live on kelp. You'll find them if you go on the beach uh, in the UK. This particular species is a species you find on the UK. So you can go and you can have a look on the beaches of pieces of kelp and you'll probably find this in the UK. And again, all the yellow dots are where it's been found in the past. Again, not, never reported in Antarctica. So this piece of kelp probably did the same thing as those little yellow dots that I showed you in the previous slide. It's probably been floating around, floating around, and it's, it's landed up in the one place in Antarctica where the environmental conditions are more likely for it to be established because deception's generally speaking warmer. But if this world's getting warmer and warmer in the next 70 years and these temperatures are increasing, there's a mechanism, there's a route now that says things can get in there. So the question now is what else can get in there? And this piece of work has been published very, very recently. Uh, and it's looking at common mussels. So again, the same thing that you can get from uh, from the beaches in the UK. And they found them at King George Island, which again, one of these islands up at the top of the peninsula, they looked at some sponges and things like that. And it's really hard to see, but they found little tiny mussels growing there. So again, this is another evidence that invasive species are getting into Antarctica. And I thought finally, I'd just sort of think about other things that are potentially getting in there and that's plastics. We know that plastics are getting to Antarctica. There's been work done by the British Antarctic Survey monitoring macroplastics, and they found that um, from 1989 up until fairly recently, there's been loads of fur seals entangled, mainly with packaging band, fishing net, that sort of thing. And we know that from albatross that have died and we've done autopsies on, you can get all sorts of stuff in the stomachs from, from them as well. That might be coming in from outside Antarctica, of course. Uh, and finally, uh, before I just show you a little video, this is some work that I did with colleagues uh, looking at where microplastics and macroplastics might be. So we, we collected all the data we could that we knew about from Antarctica. We looked at whether it was a macroplastic or a microplastic. We worked out how many people go down there each year. We worked out how many fishing vessels, how many cruise ships, how many scientific bases there are, and how much potential plastic that could produce. And what we found was when we looked at the data that we had that we collected, it was about 100,000 times higher in places than what we could have predicted from what is getting there through people going in on ships and things like that. So, again, it sort of suggests that this mechanism that I've just showed you for getting across the Antarctic current is carrying other things as well. It's carrying plastics and things that we really don't want to be getting into that sort of environment because it is totally unique. 
And I just thought I'd finish very quickly. I know I've run over a little bit, but um, I'm just going to show you this video. So this is video taken um, on a research cruise. It's it's fairly deep sea. I can't remember the exact depth. I think about uh, two, three hundred meters. And what you're seeing are all these filter feeding animals. So you've got a a, a, a tunicate. You've got uh, this sponge here with a fish in it. All the brown gloop on it is stuff that is raining down from above. So it could contain plastics, but it's lots of it is dead bodies of plankton. Um, you've got uh, predators that live down there. So you've got really unique creatures apart from the octopus. The ice fish you've just seen doesn't have any red blood cells. It just uses um, the hemolymph to, to circulate the blood. It's got extra large blood vessels and an extra large heart. You have these amazing sponges, crinoids, and you can see this marine snow. So all these things are filter feeders. So it's really important that we try to you know, minimize the amount of plastics because these are the things that are going to be taking whatever's in the water out of the water. So we, there's a beautiful, beautiful um, environment down there. It's a wonderful place and it's really not as isolated as we thought. Uh, so we have to do our best to try and, you know, protect and preserve it. Um, so hopefully I've inspired you a little bit to, to think about that maybe. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Kath. That was incredible. And I know that I've certainly got a few questions. And if any of our audience has any questions, uh, then we're actually going to be coming back to you in about five minutes or so uh, to give you a chance to answer some of these questions. And all you have to do to submit a question is comment beneath this video, and we'll be able to uh, show the actual questions on screen. Uh, but just before you go as well, because I know you you briefly touched on plastic pollution at the end of that, um, but we've actually been in touch with one of your uh, PhD research students, uh, Freya Mendrick, who's recently for World Oceans Day has produced a really fantastic video called The Journey of Plastic, which is a lovely stop motion video of how plastic gets from your, your from the, the supermarket all the way uh, to the ocean. If you want to watch that, I highly recommend it. It's really, really cool. Uh, we're gonna be posting the link in the comments below now. Now, maybe not in a bit. It'll come up in a second. You'll see that from us. It will be an Instagram link to watch that video. So thank you once again, Kath. We'll be inviting you back in about five minutes. But for now, we're going to say goodbye. Bye. Right. So let's see what the comment sections have been saying. So we've had a few people saying hello. We have uh, Christian Sanderson saying good evening from Ipswich. Good evening. What is the weather like in Ipswich? Uh, as well as that, we've got Greg, uh, Greg Shankland. Hope I'm saying that right. Hello from du Duban in South Africa. Wow. The weather must be really nice in South Africa. Um, and we've got, I think we've seen someone for, yep, we've got Penny Reeves from Nottingham uh, drinking a squash. I'm guessing that is the squash, the drink, and not a butternut squash. But if it is a butternut squash, I'd love to see how you've done that. Send us a photo. Um, and Finally, we've got oh, we've got a, we've got to show a special flamingo every time, haven't we? Amazing video, great talk. Thank you, special flamingo. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. And remember, if you have any questions, comment below. If you have any ocean facts or ocean jokes, please also comment as well. My favorite ocean jokes, a bit of a cheesy one. Uh, what did what did the ocean say to the beach? Nothing. It just waved. <laughs> And uh, my favorite fact, less than 5% of the ocean has actually been explored. So even though we have been to space and stood on the moon, we actually have not really explored the ocean that surrounds 70% of our planet, which I just find is mind blowing. Uh, so if you have any facts, any jokes like that, please keep them coming in. Right. It is time now to move on. And we're going to do something completely different with our very special guest tonight, who is a science communicator from Swindon, who after a brief stint in research as a cell biologist, now travels the country presenting science shows, teaching science communica communication skills, and has an interest in how we can make science more accessible to everyone. So ladies and gentlemen, please 
put your hands together, raise your cups, and say hello to Sarah Cosgriff. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute delight. So as Phil mentioned, I am a biologist. But the thing I've been most interested in over the years is how physics and biology are linked together. We often talk about how biology and chemistry are mates and chemistry and physics are mates. But I want to actually talk more about how biology and physics links together. And the way I'm going to do that is talking to you about how we keep astronauts safe in space through the use of the astronaut suits and how they're designed. So I'm going to show you two demonstrations tonight. I'm going to move over to my first demonstration over here. Um, but um, it's a bit of a, a little bit of home setup uh, is probably the best way to describe it. But I have this tub here and inside I'm going to show you one of them. Uh, is this cap. So it is this cap which I have duct tape, put duct tape on the bottom and I've got a little hole at the top. Inside this is some shaving foam uh, and you'll see why uh, I have put shaving foam in there. I'm going to put it inside this box uh, or salt tub and I've also got a second one here as well, very similar setup, got a hole at the top, fill with shaving foam and some duct tape in the bottom. So the idea is that these are completely sealed apart from a hole at the very top. Now, uh, this tub is a bit different than normal tubs, and that is because, if I clip the lid on top, it's got a little hole thing at the top, and that allows me to remove the air from inside it. So, if anybody's ever seen bell jars before, um, it does essentially the same thing, except we usually use these to preserve our food, uh, so we don't get air inside, and then food doesn't go off as quickly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the air from this container and what you'll start to see is something interesting happening. So I should warn you, the camera is going to shake as I do this, uh, so you might need to bear with me. But I'm going to tump from the top and if you keep an eye in the tub to see what is happening. So you should hopefully see that the shaving foam has started coming out and you should see it on the other one as well. Isn't that really interesting? So why is this happening? So we have air being removed and, you'd, and basically this is coming out of soft because you haven't got that air pressure acting upon it, it's pushing out. And you see the same thing when it comes to us being in space. And this is gonna get quite gruesome by the way. So if you think about air pressure, um, we experience it here on Earth. We have air all around us, which is made up of multiple gases, such as oxygen, and it's acting upon our bodies right now. It's actually pushing on down, down on our bodies. We don't really notice it because our body pushes back. It's uh, with the same amount of force. So we don't notice it. Um, however, what happens when you go to somewhere like space, which has no air? you're pushing your body fluids inside, that's what's causing the pressure to push out. And when it has nothing to push against anymore, then the fluids, your body fluids come out. I and mean, I did say it was gonna be really gruesome, uh, but that's what happens. So what happens, so in the films, they tend to say, oh, your head blows up. And that's what happens if you go into space without the protection of an astronaut suit. And that's not true. What happens is that your insides come outside through places through your hole, uh, your ear holes. Um, and uh, the other thing that happens is that your blood boils. Because in space, you don't have as much air or you don't have any air, which means you have a lower air pressure. You don't have that high air pressure. What we really mean by high air pressure, by the way, is just that there's lots of air particles and low is basically less air particles. So when you have no air, you're having that low pressure, uh, then what happens is that the temperature, so the boiling temperature, uh, will be lowered as well. So your blood also boils. Uh, it's pretty horrific. So uh, just to bear in mind, if you ever go to space and you're wearing a suit, don't take your helmet off. It's generally a good idea. To move on to my second demo very quickly, uh, I want to talk about uh, a really interesting design, bit of design when it comes to the suits, but something we need to be aware of. So I talked about why we need to uh, try to replicate what, um, what, why air pressure is really important when keeping astronauts safe. You want to try and replicate that environment so that you don't get the messy stuff that I just showed you. So 
There's a little bit of a problem with this though, when you pressurize astronaut suits. And that's, um, that problem is that the, um, the walls, so thinking about the clothing itself, will become quite rigid. So I'll demonstrate this using a balloon. So I've blown up this balloon. So imagine this as a pressurized suit, let's say the arm of an astronaut. And the thing is, is that once you pressurize it, it becomes quite hard to bend because with all that pressure, the walls themselves become quite rigid. So I can do it a little bit, but it's not as easy and I can only really bend it once. I can't really bend it a second time at the same time. So what you need to do is introduce breaking points. And so I've got this demonstrated with a balloon here with loads of elastic bands. So this is something you can do at home if you ever wanted to. And I can actually bend it all the way around like this. Actually bend it, even kind of do this. And it's much easier for me to bend this arm now and that introduces these breaking points. So that is something you just have to bear in mind with astronaut suits and they introduce all these breaking points in. You might notice the rings around the elbows as well. And another way in which you can do this at home, by the way, is if you use a slinky, which very blue pleater style, uh, I've got ready, um, I already have from earlier. So I have blown up a balloon in a slinky and essentially you can do the same thing. So I can actually twist this round, which might make people quite nervous. Oh, <laughs> that hasn't happened to me before. But yeah, I just uh, broke the balloon. But basically I was a I'm able to bend it around apart from the fact I just popped it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's much, much easier to do that than if you didn't have the different breaking points like the elastic, um, I've shown you with the elastic band. So yeah, that's just two demonstrations, things you could do at home, all to do with the effects of air pressure on people and why we need to think about how we design astronaut suits. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you found that enjoyable. Thank you so much, Sarah. Oh, working with balloons, it's like working with children and animals, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> sorry that that balloon popping just really caught me off guard thank you so much for that sarah and i don't know about anybody else but i have searched for that lunchbox on amazon and it is currently on its way to my flat <laughs> that is just incredible it's so much simpler as well um so quick question that i have for you it's not really a physics question um okay. when you were with the balloons with the elastic bands on and the slinky you're able to bend it is this similar, like, if you twist it then? So when you're making, like, balloon animals, is it the same concept, do you think? That is a really good question. Because um, just to talk about a separate demo, which I think could help explain this, has anybody ever done a skewer through a balloon before? There is a way in which you could do it without using tape. And the key thing is to find where there is less tension. So this is kind of specifically about balloons rather than the astronaut suits. But yeah, just thinking about areas where there's less tension. Uh, also with balloon animals, if you've ever made them, um, the balloons are different. That's the thing. They need to be different in order to do these sort of things. The balloons I use here are very much the ones you can buy in a shop rather than specifically balloon animals, which is why it popped, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think with demos like this, you need to actually spend quite a bit on, on like the balloon budget alone for the shows that that I know that you do and the shows that I've done is is probably some of the most expensive things we actually spend our money on. If you get the cheap stuff, it never works. Um, mm -hmm. Once again, thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, I know that you've got a lot happening right now during during lockdown. Uh, where, if our audience wants to see you again, where can we see your next performances? I would love for people to see me again. So uh, there are three things. Uh, there's Malvern Science in the Park that's coming up at the end of this month. That is um, a local science festival in the Malvern area. I usually go to it in person, but they're doing everything online for free. There is also Coco Mad, uh, which is uh, based in Cotteridge in Birmingham, also another uh, local uh, festival, but it's not specifically around science. There's lots of different stuff there. There is a science area that's been going on there for the last few years, thanks to a guy called Chris Hamlet. And finally, the Global Science Show. I didn't participate last month, but I reg usually not uh, participate. Uh, we tend to do videos, tweets, uh, but basically it's somebody sharing something on Twitter every 10 minutes. And I think last time they did it for 12 hours and they started off all the way from Australia and all the way to the US, I think. So it's all the way around the world. It also asks for participants. They are particularly looking for young participants for this round. So if that's something you want to participate in, please look at it but otherwise also watch it as well. There's so much talent there.
Fantastic. So we're going to put all those links uh, in a tweet. We're going to put that out from uh, the Pint of Science account as well as our own account. Sarah, once again, thank you so much. And just before uh, just before we leave, uh, if people want to get in touch with you, we've actually got your your Twitter handle. Can we bring that up? Fantastic. Are your um, so if people want to get in touch with you? There's your Twitter handle. Uh, if you want to share any of the details, let us know. And once again, we can release a tweet from the Pint of Science like that. But I'm guessing Twitter is probably the best way to get in touch with you. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, once again, Sarah, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, put your hands together, raise your cups and say bye to Sarah Cosgriff. Thank you. Fantastic. Oh. Again, that lunchbox, I cannot wait for that to arrive. It looks incredible. So let's quickly pop back to what our wonderful audience has been saying. Oh, Christian Sanderson is back saying that it is sunny in Ipswich. I'm so happy to hear that. It is sort of sunny here. The blue skies are out, but the sun is currently hiding. Uh, we've got uh, Stepen Bell Young saying hello there. Hello, Stephen. Um, and lots, lots of, well, We've got greetings from Spain. Thank you very much, Yasmin. Thank you to, for, for tuning in. Uh, how are you doing tonight? And lots of people that are enjoying the talk. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Right. So it is time now for the questions round. We've been getting quite a few questions coming in at the moment. If you do have a question you want to ask, uh, please do comment beneath the live stream and we'll display it on the stream. But before we can answer any questions, we have to once again welcome back our featured speaker tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Dr. Kath Waller. Ooh. Hello, Kath. Hello. How are you doing? Oh, great. Yeah, I love that science experiment. Loved it. I'm going to have to do that with my nieces and nephew. Brilliant. <laughs> so, we do have a few questions coming in. I <laughs> actually want to start, um, and my question's... Maybe not exactly on topic with with your talk, but as as I've asked tonight, we've been asking for uh, ocean based facts, uh, our favorite ocean based facts. And I was just wondering, someone who is an environmental marine scientist must have a plethora of favorite ocean facts. I was wondering if you might share one with us. Um, you put me on the spot there. Um, I think <laughs> the, the thing that I touched on with the ice fish. Ice fish are pretty cool. Um, so they're quite big. They live on the bottom, but they don't have any red blood cells inside them. So, you know, they don't have the normal mechanism for carrying oxygen around the body. Um, and people have thought that this is an adaptation that's been advantageous for them, you know, to help them survive in this cold environment because so much oxygen dissolved in the water. But really now we're thinking it's actually probably a mutation that's not very beneficial, but because it just happened to happen in Antarctica, they've managed to survive there. So, you know, it's sort of like an evolutionary trait that shouldn't have um, worked, but has done just because they were lucky to be in the right place. It's amazing, because I know as well, a lot, of, um, a lot of species, especially fish that live in really cold waters have even developed essentially a sort of antifreeze to stop them freezing in these yeah. waters, which is just incredible to think that that's something that exists. Yeah. Oh, sorry, carry on. <laughs> the ice fish do have the antifreeze protein as well. And the other cool thing about antifreeze proteins is that if you look at Arctic fish and Antarctic fish, they'll both have antifreeze proteins, but they will have been, they've evolved twice. They're not the same proteins, but they do the same job. So, you know, these, these survival mechanisms occur completely, you know, pulled apart, but, but they do the same job. Um, there's loads of fish that have it. Um, Mites, so mites are little tiny insects. So, it... oh, I think we might. An animal is a mite. Am I cracking up? I think you cracked up a little Can you bit. Hear me? But... Yes, you're back in the room. Or oh, back okay. online. So, little tiny mites. <laughs> Just uh, but stop me if I'm boring you, but because I do ramble on quite a lot, I get quite excited. Little tiny mites, they have antifreeze pro freeze proteins too to, to help them survive. And uh, when I was doing my PhD work, we found, I looked and we found evidence that one of the marine invertebrates also has an antifreeze protein, which is pretty cool because that's not been found before. So so that's that's quite exciting. 
Well, this is actually this this topic le links very nicely to the first question that we've been asked from uh, Praveen Paul, which was have scientists observed physiological adaptations to temperature in any species, which I'm guessing that antifreeze proteins will fit in that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, antifreeze proteins are a classic one. The, the problem with Antarctic marine species is they've they've, they've lived in this environment. So Antarctica has been where it is now for millions and millions of years. Uh, and we know at one time it was uh, temperate because we've got fossils of beech tree leaves that are very similar to the sort you get in South America. But it's been sort of thermally isolated. It's had the ice cap sitting on it for around about 35 million years. People still debate, you know, the minute eye of it. So these animals have all adapted to live in this very, very small temperature range from about minus 1.8 to plus 1.8. So that really small temperature range. So things that they do is because, because it's cold, they tend to uh, grow slower. They tend to uh, spend longer developing larvae and things like that. Uh, they, they, they don't reproduce at an early age. Um, they, they have all these adaptations. They, they respire slower. So if you, if you put a little meter into the water and look at how they use their oxygen, you can look at, um, you know, how much oxygen they use and things like that. So all of these species have got some sort of physiological adaptation to help them survive there. The problem that they are going to face is that as the, sea temperature warms which it will do can they push the envelope that they've been used to living in can they survive in plus two plus three and there's lots and lots of work done by physiologists trying to 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 guess that and we're, we're really not we're really not certain and things don't all follow the same sort of pattern either um so that is the big question is what sort of temperatures can these marine antarctic marine invertebrates uh, and fish deal with. If you're a penguin, you know you can you can sort of move around. You can find little hot, little places that are cooler and better environmental conditions. But if you're if you're a coral sitting on the bottom of the ocean, you're a bit stuck. Um, yeah. So that's that's one of the big questions that a lot of people are trying to answer. Yeah, I, I've I've heard a lot about this because the the ocean. Uh, do we do you remember the uh, there's a figure that was released? I think earlier this year about how many degrees the, the the ocean has warmed i can't quite remember it but it's 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 alarming i mean it seems like such a small number they like less than a degree but it's it creates such a big difference and in fact this leads nicely into a question from alex avery see if this pops up here other than climate change what are the biggest challenges facing uh the antarctic so I know the Antarctic is probably suffering a lot with these temperature changes, but what other challenges are, are there? There's a really good question, Alex. I mean, I think one of the problems that we've got is this, this chance of invasive species coming in. So that can be because the conditions are getting warmer and they're coming in on kelp. But one of the big things that's happening in Antarctica is um, more people are going there. So not only researchers and scientists but you've got people that go fishing there's a there are fishing um for krill fishing for toothfish uh various things plus there's a massive increase in tourism so from the 1950s or perhaps i don't know 600 people i can't remember the number but i think last year there was something like 50,000 people or 40,000 people going down as tourists so this isolation that the antarctic has had is being is being threatened and i think that you know that's going to be one of the one of the big challenges uh for antarctica you know managing fisheries um it's a massive ocean so that you know how do you police uh unlicensed fisheries you know things like that pollution um people go there there's more ships going there. We've already had one ship that um, hit a rock and, you know, uh, sank, fortunately, with no loss of life. But, you know, there's that potential. The more people that go there, the more likely this sort of thing is to happen. Um, so I think there's a lot of anthropogenic um, threats out there that will be exacerbated by climate change, potentially, but are not directly related to climate change, more related to us. Yes, I can't remember who it was that said to me this. To uh, said this to me recently, but uh, when they were doing some research, I think it was on South Georgia, uh, that they were shocked about 
how much tourism actually comes there to an area which, yes, it's it's incredible, but it's not the easiest place to get to. So just the the number of tourism that arrives, it, yeah. it to me is mind blowing. Um, I can't, <laughs> it's, I can't quite figure out. Well, not figure out, but comprehend that many people just saying, you know, what would be a great summer holiday? Let's let's catch a cruise to the Antarctic. It's just so amazing. Um, so we have here a question about your talk from Penny Reeve, mm -hmm. who actually missed a bit. So she says, I realized the cores from Antarctica were found to have plastic in 2009. Do we know the percentage change of plastic found in core then to more recent cores? Right. OK, so this is, I think she's uh, referring to, um, I think, Penny, are you referring to the study that's come out fairly recently? So there was a study that's been published in the Marine Pollution Bulletin uh, only in the last month or so, I think. I hope I'm referring to what you're thinking about. And this was where somebody had taken some ice cores in 2009 and um, they'd been put in a freezer. They'd been collected for not to look at microplastics. They'd been collected for something else. And somebody decided to have a look for microplastics. So that they only just looked for them like recently so we the, that is the first report of um microplastics in antarctic uh, ice cores i think it was taken i think it was done by some australian um researchers and it was about two kilometers from the coast so it was it was inland a little bit um and they found quite a lot of different sorts of plastics uh i can't remember 12 par particles per liter of water which is quite high but there's been nothing else done so I can't say is the more now because we haven't looked yet. So everybody now that that paper's been published are going to be going, oh, let's go get some ice cores and let's look and see whether or not, um, you know, it's increased or decreased. You've got to add a caveat to that as well, that you don't know where they've been stored or how they've been collected. So there may be contamination in there. Um, so, you know, the levels that you're getting might be that bad. They might not be. Um, but it's it's super interesting that it's there. And yeah, I would imagine that once COVID-19 has finished and we're all allowed to go and do our research again, there's going to be lots of people wanting to look at ice cores to see whether or not we can we can find out whether it's getting worse. Fantastic. We've got, oh, we should have time for two more questions. There might have to be, yes, okay. So we've got one here from, from Jessica L. Great talk. It's always nice to hear. Uh, when do you think the Antarctic will completely melt slash disappear? <laughs> if we don't make a change or do anything about climate change? That is a really, really good question. I wish I knew the answer to that, Jessica. Um, I think the, the, the Antarctic ice sheet, so ice sheets are the bits that are over the land and ice shelves are the bits that float on the sea, um, but they're different to sea ice. Um, I think the west of the Antarctic, so the Antarctic, if you, if you think about the, the maps I showed you earlier, it's got this finger of land pointing up towards South America and then it comes sort of down around. That's one bit of Antarctica. And then you've got the East Antarctic ice sheet. That's a lot more stable, I think. I'm not an ice sheet expert, so I'm, I'm putting caveats on all of this. Otherwise, I'll get my colleagues saying, you said this. Um, but the East Antarctic ice sheet seems to be a lot um, more stable than the West Antarctic ice sheet. And the peninsula and that area down there um, certainly is getting more warming. Um, so if anywhere's going to go first, it's going to be the West Antarctic ice sheet. I don't think we're going to see. I don't know is a short answer, but I don't. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be. I don't think we're going to have to have a day after tomorrow sort of scenario or anything like that. Um, but we do have to cut carbon emissions. You know, there's no two ways about that. We have to. We have to cut our fossil fuels and, and that sort of thing. Um, because if we do if we do carry on at some point, the Greenland ice sheet will melt. Uh, if the whole of the Antarctic ice sheet did melt, I think, oh, I think the sea level rise, the global sea level rise would be something like 60 meters. Um, if the Iceland, if the Greenland ice sheet goes, it'll be about seven meters. And I think there's much more chance the Greenland ice sheet's much more vulnerable. Um, so that's the one we should be worrying about, I think, for now. So we, we have time for one more very quick question. And this one comes from Stephen Durr, uh, who asks, what happens to all the rubbish the scientists make while living and working in the Antarctic? So what, what do you do with your rubbish when you're out on your research in South Georgia or the Adelaide Islands? We bring it all back with us. 
so um everything goes if it if it's incineratable i think that you know they will incinerate it but anything that you, plastics things like that come back uh paints chemicals come back um i'm going to tell you something gross here but i once worked on on a an island called livingston island uh in tents living in little tents for eight weeks i'm not a tent person um and we had to we had our own poo pots so we we brought everything back with us literally everything so that's what's supposed to happen fantastic right so uh really quickly i, I just think because it's always nice when people do this but uh jessica l has actually written back saying thank you very much for the uh answer that was the one on melting uh how how soon will it be when the arctic melts so we are going to have to stop the questions there but before we do if anyone does have any further questions or uh wants to continue this conversation would you mind if they tweeted you directly absolutely yeah so yeah. we're just gonna put your your twitter handle again here fantastic there we go uh so once again thank you so much for talking today uh, i've had a great time uh, our audience have had a great time and uh, well, hopefully, you know, it won't be too long before you're back out there conducting your research. So thank you once again. And everybody, round of applause for Dr. Kath Waller. See you later. Bye. Fantastic. So that brings us to the end of another Cup of Science episode. We have ran over a little bit today, but I hope you've had a great time. Please let us know what you feel about this episode, what you feel about this series. You can do this by commenting beneath this video or tweeting us using hashtag Cup of Science or at Pint of Science or at Philby91. We will, of course, be tweeting out all the links from that were mentioned in today's episode. So if you do want to follow anything up, please visit Twitter and follow at Pint of Science. So before we go, just a quick shout out for next week because we have another episode planned. Uh, next week's going to be a little bit different because our featured guest is on the uh, link between using art to talk about science by science artist and science communicator Kelly Stanford. Plus, we have a halftime act from Dr. Christopher Clark, which will all be about uh, which will all be science you can do in your kitchen. It's going to be a very tasty episode. So tune in for that. We will be sending out the links to that episode once again on Twitter and beneath this video. So that's it from us. I hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of your evening. Thanks again for tuning in. And oh, wait one second. We've had one thing I wanted to bring up. We have had one pun. Here we go. Ice fish, a pretty cool pun intended. Thank you, Alex, for that. So I, I couldn't end the show without one other joke or pun. Thank you all so much. That's it from us. Have a wonderful evening. See you later.